what the cardiologist uh, needs to know about uh, COVID-19 and the cardiovascular disease. So in a couple of minutes, I'm going to cover uh, very important points, uh, COVID-19 biology, diagnosis of COVID-19, uh, cardiovascular comorbidities in patients with COVID-19, the mechanisms of cardiac involvement in patients with COVID-19, uh, the cardiovascular risks from COVID-19 uh, regarding myocardial injury, myocarditis, acute coronary syndrome, uh, what is the difference between uh, COVID-19 and the heart failure? Is it COVID-19 or heart failure or both? And how to handle the medications of cardiovascular drugs in the setting of uh, positive uh, patients with COVID-19? So we know that uh, COVID-19 is caused by a pathogen uh, known as uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is a novel enveloped RNA beta coronavirus that is thought to originate in bats. The infection mainly occurs when this virus uh, caused by binding of the spike protein on the surface of the virus to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which is known as ACE2 receptor. According to this mechanism, the virus will be internalized and propagated within the cell with, with viral replication. So the key factor in the pathogenesis of uh, COVID-19 is uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, which is found mainly in new sites in the lungs, as well as in heart, arteries, kidneys, and intestine. And when activated is 2 normally it converts angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 to 7, which has a vasodilator effect. So this is a beneficial effect. But when SARS-CoV-2 bind to this uh, receptor, ACE2, this will lead to down regulation of the ACE2. And accordingly, angiotensin 2 will increase. And angiotensin 2 has a deleterious effect because it induces acute lung injury, adverse myocardial remodeling, vasoconstriction, and the increased vascular... Dr. Ayman, do you hear me? I'm listening to the slides, but the slides are not coming out of the screen. I'm going to use the chair screen. Yeah. I mean, the sound is very clear, but there are no slides coming out of the screen. So, the chair screen is coming out of the screen. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you, thank you. So, the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 is found into angiotensin-converting enzyme ACE2, and this will lead to entry of the virus, uh, internalization, uh, endocytosis, uh, replication, and the consequently down regulation of uh, ACE2. And with down regulation of ACE2, so there is no more conversion of angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 to 7, which has a vasodilator effect. So angiotensin 2 will increase, which has a deleterious effect because it induces uh, acute lung injury adverse myocardial remodeling, vasoconstriction, and the increased vascular permeability, and this will lead to ARDS. The spectrum of COVID-19, as we know, that 81% uh, of cases uh, are mild cases with no pneumonia or mild pneumonia. However, 14% of patients are uh, presenting with shortness of breath with a respiratory rate of more than 30 per minute with desaturation, oxygen saturation less than 93%, with lung infiltrates more than 50% within one to two days. However, 5% of patients have a critical situation in the form of uh, shock, uh, needs for mechanical ventilation, and at the end, the multi-organ failure, which is, is responsible for increased mortality. The clinical features of COVID-19, as we know, have a different presentations, fever, cough, myalgia or fatigue, sputum production, diarrhea, leukopenia, lymphopenia, high liver enzymes, high creatinine, increased LDH, uh, increased troponin I in 12% of patients, and the pro, uh, procalcitonin may be normal or decreased, and around 30% of patients uh, develop acute respiratory distress syndrome, acute cardiac injury, have been reported in 12%, acute kidney injury in 7%, septic shock 7%, and secondary infection in 10%. And the diagnostic criteria of COVID-19, suspected cases, uh, as we know, uh, 
travel to uh, areas uh, in which COVID-19 is now COVID-19 is present all over the world. The contact with patients who have COVID-19, contact with patients with fever or respiratory symptoms suggestive of COVID-19 or uh, cluster cases. Clinical symptoms, fever, respiratory symptoms, imaging characteristic of COVID-19, normal or decreased leukocytic count, and uh, lymphopenia. So any one criteria of epidemiological history plus any two clinical symptoms uh, indicate suspected cases, and all three clinical symptoms also indicate suspected cases. While confirmed cases, it means suspected cases plus etiological or serological evidence of COVID-19 in the form of uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA positive by PCR serology uh, specific uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2 IgGm and IgG uh, are positive in the serum. So let us to start with uh, cardiac injury in patients with COVID-19 because COVID-19 is not only a disease of the respiratory system. The mortality in most of the cases are cardiac uh, in etiology. Why this happens? Because uh, COVID-19 could, through the ACE2 mediated direct damage, will uh, lead to increased affinity uh, by, to angiotensin converting enzyme A2 with consequent increase in angiotensin 2 levels uh, or reduced expression of the e, uh, ACE2 because the virus uh, mainly works through ACE2 and the uh, dysregulation of the renin angiotensin system. Hypoxia induced myocardial injury, one of the mechanisms, because this will lead to increased oxidative stress, intracellular acidosis, and the mitochondrial damage. Cardiac microvascular damage also has been speculated to play an important role and increase the vessel hyperpermeability, uh, uh, angiospasm, microthrombosis also are involved in the pathogenesis. And finally, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Uh, characterized by cytokine storm, in which uh, a release of uh, more of the elements responsible for cytokine storm, such as interleukin-6, such as uh, uh, troponin, and uh, increased inflammatory markers, which will lead to this uh, uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, as well as uh, dysregulated immunocytes and uncontrolled inflammations. All these mechanisms will lead to acute cardiac injury in patients who have uh, COVID-19. So the cardiac manifestations of COVID-19 may be one of the following. Acute myocardial injury, and this is detected by high level of uh, high sensitive troponin I, ECG changes, and left ventricular systolic or diastolic dysfunction. Myocarditis, tachycardia cardiomyopathy, and at the end, multi-organ failure. Myocardial infarction could be type 2 myocardial infarction due to uh, 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 supply demand imbalance or microvascular dysfunction or a myocardial infarction with normal coronary arteries known as uh, minoca. Par pericarditis may be effusion and tamponade in some cases. Pulmonary embolism also have been reported, which should be suspected when the patients develop sudden deterioration in addition to hypotension. Heart failure could be de novo heart failure, acute decompensated heart failure in patients who have previous heart failure, half ref or half ref also have been reported. Cardiogenic shock, different arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, ventricular arrhythmias, and finally sudden death, even in patients who have been recovered, some cases have sudden cardiac death, which may be one of the causes uh, long QT syndrome, for example, due to the medications. This is an example uh, from an autopsy, patients who have uh, myocarditis, and if we look here, we can see the mononuclear cell infiltrations of the myocardium indicating the myocarditis. It's a diffuse in the lungs, in the liver, as well as in the myocardium, in addition to microthrombosis. And this is one of the papers which have been published in JAMA recently uh, for more than 1,000 patients uh, suspected to have uh, COVID-19. At the end, they did an analysis for uh, 416 patients who have uh, confirmed COVID-19. 82 patients have cardiac injury detected by a high level of uh, cardiac troponin, and uh, more than 300 patients have no cardiac injury. If we look for the outcome with the survival, the survival rate uh, was high in patients who have no cardiac involvement. So 51% mortality was cardiac involvement compared with 5% 
in patients who have no evidence of cardiac involvement. And this is a multivariate Cox regression analysis on the risk factors associated with mortality. And again, we can see that in the presence of cardiac injury, uh, the hazard ratio for mortality from the symptom onset or from admission is significant with a B value significant compared with other variables included in the analysis. So cardiac injury is an important predictor of mortality in patients with COVID-19. And another study involved more than 130 patients looking for cardiac involvement. And we can see that arrhythmias have been involved in 16%, acute cardiac injury 7%, and troponin was high. So if you look for patients who need ICU admission compared with patients who have not admitted to the ICU, we can see that acute cardiac injury and arrhythmias have been associated with the need for admission to the intensive care unit. And this is a very interesting review article for the potential effects of coronavirus on the cardiovascular system. And again, the coronavirus can affect the myocardium, lead to myocarditis, and severe myocarditis can develop with reduced systolic function, with increased biomarkers, and the myocardial injury is likely associated with infection-related myocarditis and or ischemia, and it is considered as an important prognostic marker. Again, patients who have underlying cardiovascular disease, hypertension, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy, viral illness in such patients can lead to more viral direct damage by the virus, increased systemic inflammatory response, destabilization of coronary plaques, and aggravated hypoxia. So these data suggest that myocardial biomarkers should be evaluated in patients with cardiovascular disease who develop COVID-19 for risk stratification, as well as for early and aggressive intervention. This is very important. And the conclusion of this interesting paper that myocardial injury is significantly associated with fatal outcome of COVID-19. Although the prognosis of patients with underlying cardiovascular disease but without myocardial injury is relatively favorable, however, myocardial injury is associated with cardiac dysfunction and arrhythmias, and the inflammation may be a potential mechanism. Aggressive treatment may be considered for patients at high risk of myocardial injury. This is an example for a young patients who have COVID-19 positive, chest pain, dyspnea, X-ray, cardiomegaly, chest CT suggestive of COVID-19, ECG have an evidence of ST elevation inferior leads, high levels of cardiac troponin, ejection fraction 27%. So fulminant myocarditis in this situation, which was, was treated aggressively, including the my immunoglobulin as well as steroids. And one week later, we can see that the chest X-ray normalized and the ejection fraction returned to normal. So fulminant myocarditis in such situation is very important because it can lead to mortality. Abnormal coagulation is common in severe COVID-19 and D-dimer levels can be increased. So significantly increased D-dimer, as we can see, is uh, associated with poor prognosis as well as fibrinogen degradation, fibrin degradation products. Vascular endothelial inflammation with extensive intravascular microthrombosis by autopsy have been detected. So this raises the question, do we need anticoagulation in those patients? So anticoagulation therapy should be considered and initiated for severe COVID-19 patients if it is not contraindicated because pulmonary uh, embolism is common in such situation. And this is an interesting slide showed that the factors associated with increase the incidence of uh, ARDS as well as increased mortality, age above 65 years, Comorbid conditions like hypertension, diabetes, fever, lymphopenia, elevated end organ in this like liver enzymes, PUN, elevated inflammatory markers, CRP and ferritin, and increased coagulation markers like D-dimer and uh, prothrombin time. And this is a post-mortem for one of the patients who died uh, due to COVID-19, and we can see the significant hemorrhagic necrosis in the lungs due to this disease. So patients with COVID-19 can develop acute coronary syndrome, yes, because COVID-19 can trigger many of the pathways which increase 
the susceptibility to acute coronary syndrome. Endothelial activation, oxidation of LDL, uh, increased platelet activation, expression of tissue factor. So we can see acute coronary syndrome in such situations. And the myocardial infarction may be type 1 due to rupture plaque or type 2 due to uh, oxygen supply demand imbalance in such situations due to hypoxia. And this is an example for patients who have STEMI, ST elevation inferior leads, uh, and increased uh, troponin uh, ejection fraction decreased to 45%, uh, and he was treated for acute coronary syndrome and COVID-19. So uh, what are the recommendations? for management of patients who have acute myocardial infarction during COVID-19 outbreak. Now we have many recommendations. If we look for the EC, and this also was confirmed by the ACC, how to manage patients presenting with acute myocardial infarction. Emergency intravenous thrombolysis is the fairest choice for acute STEMI. For STEMI patients with confirmed COVID-19, Strict isolation should be started, and uh, you have uh, to rule out contraindications for thrombolytic therapy. So if COVID-19 could be excluded by the expert group within less than one hour, the possibility of having COVID-19 is small. So in such situations, we can monitor closely and conduct a PCI with coronary intervention immediately after eliminating COVID-19. Or to proceed with the thrombolytic therapy, the decision should be done according to the benefit to risk ratio. For non STEMI, the grace risk stratification is important to identify high risk patients who are considered a candidate for uh, intervention. However, medical treatment uh, should be given and the risk stratification should be conducted while awaiting the results of uh, ruling out uh, COVID-19. So for non STEMI patients excluded from COVID-19, early or time-limited uh, intervention should be selected immediately according to the risk stratification. If you have a high grade risk score and COVID-19 excluded, so interventions can be done, otherwise, Medical treatment is the main strategy of treatment for those patients. And uh, this slide uh, shows the pathway for management of uh, STEMI after ruling out uh, COVID-19 and the high-risk patients with cardiogenic shock, hemodynamic instability, ongoing refractory chest pain, uh, or uh, patients who receive thrombolysis and still have chest pain, so risk of PCI is uh, recommended. And again, uh, non STEMI patients, uh, grace risk score, stratification, high risk patients uh, should be admitted to the CCU, and uh, PCI should be done after rule out uh, COVID 19. Otherwise, uh, conservative strategy is the main uh, approach for patients uh, with non STEMI, uh, especially if he has a low grace risk score. The SKY uh, recommendations regarding the management of uh, STEMI patients. Uh, uh, also, they recommended that uh, fibrinolytic therapy may be considered in low-risk STEMI patients, patients who have inferior STEMI without right ventricular involvement or lateral myocardial infarction without hemodynamic compromise. And in the high-risk patients like cardiogenic shock uh, uh, patients, the PCI should be done. However, in the cath lab, maximal protection is important to prevent staff exposure should be uh, this should be including uh, effective personal protective equipment. PPE is very important uh, uh, in this situation in the cath lab to protect the operator as well as all uh, staff in the cath lab. Now, patients uh, with heart failure presenting with more shortness of breath, cough, if this is a decompensated heart failure or this is COVID-19 and how to differentiate. So this is a very important statement by the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, uh, features that would increase the probability of COVID-19 versus heart failure exacerbation. If the patients have increased individual risk of contracting COVID-19 uh, uh, degree of isolation, according to the uh, degree of isolation, social distancing, amount of uh, community spread of COVID-19, uh, uh, the risk factors uh, for uh, developing COVID-19. You have to review all this by the history. 
However, the presence of fever and or the novo viral symptoms like cough, myalgia, and fatigue, uh, uh, fever is present in 50 to 80 percent of patients. So this increased the possibility of COVID-19. The absence of typical features of heart failure like weight gain, uh, ankle edema, uh, the pattern of shortness of breath is different. Patients with acute decompensated heart failure usually have uh, dyspnea associated with paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. So in such situation, it is uh, some uh, it's different from the uh, uh, usual presentation of acute decompensated heart failure. And very importantly, the lack of response to diuretics. This in favor of uh, COVID-19. Don't depend on natriuretic peptides and troponin because both are increased in COVID-19 and they cannot uh, differentiate. So follow-up communication is important to assess for symptoms, resolution, or progression at 24 hours to 48 hours uh, uh, according to the clinical situations to differentiate between COVID-19 and heart failure. So uh, this uh, uh, diagram shows that uh, is it heart failure or is it a COVID-19 according to the history, according to the, the novo viral symptoms and or fever. So this is indicates that COVID-19 is more likely. However, if the patient's presenting mainly with uh, dyspnea, cough, uh, fatigue, uh, so heart failure or COVID-19 could be a possibility, but in the presence of uh, more edema, ascites, weight gain only, only this uh, favors the diagnosis of uh, heart failure after excluding COVID-19. So going to the strategy of management for severe patients with COVID-19 and develop heart dysfunction, you have uh, to treat based on symptoms, prevent complications, treat pre-existing disease, organ uh, functional support in time. So uh, respiratory support for critically ill patients, acute heart failure, ECMO should be available. Circulatory support, uh, fluid resuscitation, improve the microcirculation, uh, continuous renal replacement therapy to uh, uh, protect the kidney as early as possible, survival plasma therapy for critically ill patients with rapid progress, blood purification treatment for cytokine storm, and in patients who develop cytokine storm, the use of interleukin-6 uh, blocker like uh, to see to see uh, to see uh, have been very effective uh, in treating patients with severe illness with uh, cytokine storm. A very important uh, entity in treating patients with uh, COVID-19, whether to continue ACE inhibitor or ARPs or to stop these medications. Why this question is important? Because uh, at the beginning of uh, COVID-19 treatment, there was a concern about the use of ACE inhibitor and the ARPs uh, and whether the continuation of ACE or ARPs uh, is a deleterious or not because uh, uh, the virus mainly act through uh, ACE2 uh, and the, the use of more ACE2 lead to uh, uh, more down regulation of ACE2 with increased angiotensin 2. So uh, this uh, 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 concern was uh, abandoned and abolished by the new recommendations. If we look for the ACCAHA recommendation, uh, we can see that uh, the recommendation is to continue RAS blockers, whether ACE or ARPs, and individualized treatment decision should be done according to the hemodynamic status and according to the clinical presentation. EC Council on Hypertension, European Society of Hypertension, all these uh, statements uh, are strongly recommend the continuation of ACE inhibitor ARPs in patients who have hypertension, heart failure, ischemic heart disease uh, during uh, COVID-19, and we don't have any evidence to stop uh, these beneficial medications when you are treating patients who have cardiovascular disease on ACE inhibitor or, or, or ARPs. And these recommendations also from uh, the Canadian Society of Hypertension, uh, the uh, Canadian Cardiovascular Society and Canadian Heart Failure Society, International Society of Hypertension, the British uh, Cardiac Society. And the take home message regarding the, this important uh, point that uh, uh, ACE2 protein facilitates entry of uh, coronavirus into the cells. Uh, ACE inhibitors uh, do not impact ACE2 because ACE and ACE2 are uh, different enzymes. And uh, there is no any evidence support that uh, the hypothesis that ACE inhibitor or uh, ARPs uh, increase expression and uh, increase uh, coronavirus entry. So the current evidence does not support 
the discontinuation of ACE inhibitor treatment due to coronavirus uh, infection. So you have to continue ACE and ARBs in those patients. And this is uh, an interesting slide that shows uh, how uh, 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 to handle uh, the medications, uh, cardiovascular medications during treatment of COVID-19. Uh, what about antiplatelets, statins, uh, antiarrhythmic drugs? Uh, if we look for aspirin, it is safe. Uh, P2Y12 inhibitor, especially after PCI, is important. Uh, uh, anticoagulation, uh, NOAX or uh, VKA, uh, you have to be very cautiously and you can replace by intravenous heparin. Uh, statins are safe uh, to be maintained in primary and secondary prevention, but you have to look for liver enzymes. If the liver enzymes are very high, so statins should be stopped and you can give a drug like uh, ezetimibe. Beta blockers uh, uh, in the presence of severe hypoxia, severe airway spasm, in such situations, you have to stop beta blockers and you can give evabradine to control heart rate. However, in the absence of severe hypoxia or uh, uh, severe bronchospasm, beta blockers can be given in the form of beta-1 selective uh, beta blockers like metoprolol or uh, pisoprolol. Uh, the drugs which increase QT interval, you have to be very cautiously with flicanide, amiodarone, sutalol, because uh, chloroquine, hydroxy hydroxychloroquine drugs, which are used in treatment of coronavirus, increase the QT interval. So you have to be very cautiously when combining other drugs which prolong QT interval. The same with diuretics, which induce hypokalemia and they can increase the long QT, and colchicine is safe. Uh, uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory, you have to be very cautious it and to be stopped if possible. And digoxin also to be stopped if possible. And you have to measure the QT and uh, the digoxin level also is important. Drug-drug interaction uh, is uh, important uh, when you are treating uh, patients because uh, inhibitors of cytochrome P3A, uh, uh, which is an isomer of cytochrome P45, uh, so uh, antiviral drugs like uh, lopinavir and ritonavir may increase liver injury and they cause elevation of muscle enzymes, especially if taken with the statins like atorvastatin and simvastatin. Also, you have to be very alert to the direct or indirect damaging effect of antiviral drugs on the heart. So chloroquine, again, uh, uh, increase uh, the uh, uh, probability of sudden death due to torsadibois and uh, long QT interval. Antiviral drugs may lower the heart rate uh, by unknown uh, mechanism. So uh, this is uh, also a very interesting risk score uh, for uh, drug-associated uh, Q corrective QT uh, prolongation. Uh, so uh, if you have an age above eight, uh, 68, uh, you will get one point. Uh, female gender, uh, the use of loop diuretics, hypokalemia, a baseline corrective QT more than 450 millisecond, acute MI. Uh, more than two drugs, uh, prolonged QT interval, sepsis, heart failure. You have to use uh, this risk score. If you have a low score less than six points, so uh, the risk for uh, QT prolongation is uh, very low. A moderate risk if you have seven to 10 points, while if you have uh, uh, total points of more than 11 points, this indicates a high risk patients to develop uh, uh, long QT syndrome uh, with the risk of uh, torsadibois and serious ventricular arrhythmias and increased mortality. Again, this is uh, also an algorithm uh, before starting the hydroxychloroquine, which prolongs the QT interval. You have to rule out uh, congenital long QT syndrome, acquired long QT syndrome, uh, drugs which prolong QT interval, like uh, adithromycin, structural heart disease, bradycardia. And then you have to uh, calculate uh, the correct QT, especially after the first dose, uh, and you have to be very cautiously if the patients uh, develop the more prolongation of the correct QT about 500 millisecond or uh, increase ventricular activity because this increases the risk more. So at the end, the uh, uh, management of uh, strategy of COVID-19 combined with uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, uh, early uh, self-management is very important and you have to avoid the acute cardiac events, heart failure and acute coronary syndrome. Uh, diagnosis of COVID-19 early is very important with the ECG and blood pressure monitoring and the early intervention. Respiratory support uh, for patients who have uh, evidence of hypoxia, circulatory support, uh, immunotherapy in severe cases with uh, uh, cytokine storm by the use of uh, tocilizumab, uh, very important. 
and uh, you have to rule out uh, drug drug interaction especially drugs which induce uh, pro arrhythmic effect uh, vasoactive agents inducing uh, acute uh, uh, coronary events due to vasospasm drug interaction which induce uh, liver injury at the end uh, i'd like uh, to thank you uh, for your attention and uh, please uh, stay home uh, stay safe stay safe thank you very much